So what I'm going to do is, first of all, start with uh, what is it that we, my organisation, the Committee on Climate Change, uh, are required to do under the Climate Change Act, and then I will move on and talk about some of the things that we have uh, actually done in the three years that we've uh, existed. So the ambition we have recommended for the UK uh, government and the parliament and, and some of the stuff we've had to say on uh, sectoral uh, emissions reductions. So first of all, what do we have to do as the uh, Committee on Climate Change? I should say we were established in December 2008 uh, when the Climate Change Act became legislation uh, in the UK. We actually existed for about a year before that in shadow form so that we could develop our advice on things like uh, the 2050 target. So you can see on the left-hand side of that slide there, uh, we uh, are supposed to recommend ambition on the 2050 target. We did that back in 2008. We talked about whether it should be 60% or 80% or more, and I've got a couple of slides on that in a minute. We also have to advise on uh, something called carbon budgets, so that's five-year ceilings on uh, emissions in the UK. And in the first instance, we talked about uh, the three carbon budgets going out to 2022. Uh, we've recently uh, advised the government uh, on something called the fourth carbon budget, which covers the period 2023 20, to 27. And again, I've got a few slides on uh, the fourth carbon budget, which was very high profile in the UK. It was a, uh, a very tense uh, debate that we had there across the government and the various other stakeholders to get that fourth carbon budget into legislation. Uh, we're not just asked about the ambition for carbon budgets, but we have to advise on uh, within that what is the appropriate balance of uh, domestic emissions reductions versus the purchase of emissions reductions in other countries through the uh, carbon market. And in doing that, we have to take a view on, well, what are the sectoral opportunities for emissions reductions here in the UK? Uh, we uh, are asked, and we have to do this next year, to advise whether aviation and shipping should be included in carbon budgets. That's a key issue. Uh, in the case of the UK, it was fudged a little bit. So when we had the Climate Change Act, first in legislation, this was kicked into the long grass, although we do have to revisit the issue next year, so uh, a big decision to make there. In the case of Scotland, in contrast, which has a Climate Change Act, they decided from the beginning to include aviation and shipping in their uh, framework and in their carbon targets. And then, uh, it's a very live issue, should carbon budgets and carbon targets be about CO2 or should it be all greenhouse gases? We were asked to advise on that. and. Uh, we advise that it should be all greenhouse gases. And so the 80% target, which we recommended, is for all greenhouse gases, not just uh, CO2. It's a set of things we have to think about uh, in advising the government and in advising Parliament. And you can see those on the right-hand side there. So competitiveness is a, a key issue for the energy-intensive industries and one that we are heavily scrutinised uh, by those industries when we make our uh, recommendations. Security of supply, uh, obviously... Uh, very important fuel poverty, well, energy bills, rising energy prices are a key political issue in the UK at the moment, and I think uh, probably they are here in Ireland as well. Uh, the Treasury is very interested in, well, what is the impact of carbon budgets on our fiscal uh, position? So we have to look in detail at all of these aspects uh, in the context of our advice. Second thing we do is, well, it's no good just setting ambitious targets and then walking away and forgetting about these. I think if we were to do that, well, nothing much would happen, and uh, over time we'd see that we were off track and we wouldn't meet our carbon budget. So a very important part of our job is to uh, look at progress reducing emissions, which we do on an annual basis, and we provide an annual report to Parliament, which not only says, uh, have we reduced emissions, are we within the limits retrospectively, we also take a forward look and say, well, are we on track to cut emissions in the future, uh, given that we have a strong sense of what we need to do in the future. Well, there's implications for now. Are we uh, doing those things we need to do? And then there's a set of things we do, uh, specific pieces of advice which the government requests from us. So, for example, we've done a review of aviation emissions. We've done a review of renewable energy. Uh, we've done a review of uh, the cap and trade scheme called the carbon reduction commitment for the non-energy intensive uh, sectors. And we've done a low carbon innovation review. So that's <coughs> us, that's what we do under the Climate Change Act. Um, with that introduction, what I want to talk about is first of all our 2050 target. Then I quickly want to move on to uh, a 2030 target and the fourth carbon budget. Uh, 
and then I want to talk about budget costs and policy implications. So I want to finish off with, well, how are we actually doing in the UK, not just on grandstanding and making very ambitious commitments, but also getting our emissions down. So, the 2050 target, the starting point uh, for all of our advice, both on the longer term target and the carbon budgets has to be the climate change science. And so that's written in the Climate Change Act. And I was given a copy of the Daily Mail coming onto the, uh, the aeroplane to get over this morning. And, and in the Daily Mail, it said, well, you know, the science now tells us that the, the world is going to get colder, not warmer. And they're uh, picking up a, a piece of evidence that uh, was produced by University of Reading recently and, and totally misrepresenting it. But uh, in our advice on the fourth carbon budget, we did go back and look at the science. We reviewed not just the 200 years of science evidence that we have, but the most uh, recently uh, peer-reviewed 500 articles that have been in the last couple of years. And that review said, well, global climate change is already happening, but we can measure that. Uh, it's very hard to dispute that. There's a high degree of confidence that uh, it's largely, uh, not all, but largely uh, due to human activity, so the burning of fossil fuels they're putting into the atmosphere of something we know traps heat in the atmosphere, then uh, without action, so on a business as usual path, uh, there would be some very bad consequences for both human welfare and ecosystems. But I think the main message there is that we still have the opportunity to reduce emissions and mitigate these risks of uh, dangerous climate change. So that was in the fourth carbon budget. This just goes back to the thought process we went through to get to the 80% target. So this is the IPCC's uh, assessment of the kind of risks we face in a world of dangerous climate change. And I'm not going to dwell on that because I think you're probably all familiar with it, but certainly not a very good picture. I think it's dangerous uh, uh, in this space to be apocalyptic and to, to focus on these things. But I think as a departure point, uh, we can start there and then move quickly on to, well, what can we do to avoid being in a world of flooding and disease and, and starvation and uh, those very negative uh, outcomes for, for people. So what we did, and coming up with the 80% target is we said, well, what is an appropriate objective from a climate perspective? And, and for us, an objective was we should keep uh, uh, central estimates of global mean temperature change as close as we can to two degrees, but we should also keep the probabilities of dangerous uh, temperature change, and we say there, dangerous uh, temperature changes above four degrees. Well, we should keep those scenarios to very low levels. And against that objective, we ran uh, various global emissions scenarios and the ones that meet that objective have global emissions peaking in 2020 and then very deep cuts thereafter such that we get to uh, a 50% cut in global emissions by 2050. Now then you ask well what does a 50% global emissions reduction uh, mean for the UK or for uh, developed countries like the UK, Ireland for example. Uh, our argumentation was well if global emissions are about 20 to 24 gigatons in 2050, uh, works out about two tonnes per capita. Then we used Nick Stern's argument, it's very hard to see uh, a global agreement which allows uh, the UK to emit more than the global average in 2050. And on that basis, well, two tonnes per capita translates into an 80% emissions reduction. So that's where the 80% target comes from. And this is what the 80% target uh, means. And you can see there on the left-hand side, UK emissions are 670 uh, million tonnes uh, or thereabouts at the moment, and we need to get those down to 160 million tonnes. And there's a couple of things to say about this picture. Clearly, it's a, a massive challenge to go from 670 down to uh, 160. Uh, now, one of the things uh, that we have been pretty strong on is, whilst we come by uh, offset credits in the global carbon market at the moment, they are abundant, they're cheap, you can't plan uh, that that will be the case in the future. So as you get to 2050, as all countries are trying to get their emissions down, well, uh, it's hard to see uh, who will be selling those credits, and certainly you can't plan for them being cheap in 2050. So for us, uh, we need to plan to get to that 160 million tonnes, largely through domestic emissions reductions. And the second thing is, if you look at those uh, sectors on the left-hand side, well, international aviation, very hard to see how we can get aviation emissions down by 80%. I think the same is true of agriculture, where there's limited opportunities for abatement. Industry, at the moment, we haven't got a strong story for how you could get those emissions down. And the implication is, well, uh, if you've got those hard-to-treat sectors, well, you need to get emissions in the other sectors where we do have the abatement op 
where we do have the abatement options, you need to get those emissions uh, further than 80% and close to zero carbon. And power, uh, heat and surface transport are the obvious examples there. So we need to actually go further than 80% in those key uh, emitting sectors. Now, 2050 uh, is a long way away. And certainly for me, I thought, well, the 2050 target isn't that interesting. But I think it is interesting, having worked on it now for a number of years. It's interesting insofar as it has implications for uh, the medium term and that the medium term has implications for the nearer term uh, approaches that we need to put in place at the moment to be on track to that longer term objective. So uh, I'm going to move on to talking about the 2030 target and the fourth carbon budget. Now, if you've got to get an 80% emissions reduction in 2050 and if you've got to go further in some of the key sectors like power, like buildings, like surface transport, well, there is an implication that you need to be doing something in 2030. It's not the case that you can plausibly say we're going to go right through to the mid-2040s and do nothing and suddenly fall off a cliff with emissions in uh, all of these sectors. So uh, given capital stock turnover, given uh, availability of technologies, there is an implication of 2050 for 2030. And then there's another way of thinking about things, which is, well, uh, there is a set of abatement opportunities we have. Those have costs associated. Uh, there is a, a carbon price in the global market. You can compare those costs and those carbon prices and say, well, it makes sense to do something if it costs less than the carbon price. And then the science tells you as well, it's not just about uh, a point estimate of emissions in 2050. It's the area under the curve. It's the cumulative emissions, uh, both here but globally, to 2050 that will determine the extent of climate change. So we have to get our emissions down in uh, 2030, in the period to 2030, so that the cumulative emissions are within uh, the limits that keep the risks of dangerous climate change down. Now, we adopted all of those three ways of looking at the problem uh, to come up with a 2030 recommendation, and they all bring you out actually in a similar place, which is by 2030, we should be aiming to reduce emissions by about 60% on 1990 levels. And you can see there the third bar uh, for 2030, it tells you where those emissions reductions come from. And most of them come from uh, those sectors where we've got a, a strong sense of what the options are. Uh, so the power sector, heat in buildings, and surface transport. And let me just take you through very quickly uh, there what the story is. So in the power sector, uh, what we envisage is that uh, over the next decade, there'll be a, a, a reduction in uh, emissions. Sorry, if we look at the top left-hand picture, what we envisage is that there'll be a reduction in demand over the next decade through energy efficiency improvements, so more efficient lighting and appliances. But after that, there'll be very significant growth, and that growth comes from the development of new markets for electricity, and those markets are uh, namely uh, electric vehicles, so electric cars and electric vans, but also electric forms of heating, and in particular air source and ground source heat pumps. At the same time, we've got an opportunity to drastically cut the carbon intensity of power generation. So we can get that down, we think, through a combination of nuclear, renewables, and carbon capture and storage. We can get our carbon intensity down from about 500 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour at the moment in the UK down to about 50 uh, grams over the next two uh, decades. And the combination of those two things is that uh, there's a great opportunity to get emissions right down uh, in the power sector. If we move on to cars, again, there's a similar story. We don't think that in tackling climate change and reducing emissions that people have to become less mobile. And so you can see in the top left-hand picture there that we envisage demand for uh, car travel going up over the next two decades. But at the same time, there's a big opportunity to get the carbon intensity of car travel uh, down. And the combination of those two things is that car emissions uh, whilst they have gone up in the last years, uh, can be very significantly uh, cut over the next two decades. And just a sense of how we might achieve that, well, this is a snapshot of 2030. It's not a blueprint of exactly where we should be, but order of magnitude, it tells you. By 2030, most people in a carbon-constrained world should be buying uh, not just a, an efficient conventional vehicle, but uh, an ultra-low carbon uh, vehicle, whether it's plug-in hybrids or whether it's pure battery electric vehicles, possibly it might be hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, but by that time most people should be buying that kind of uh, vehicle in order to be uh, where we need to be in terms of cutting our emissions and meeting carbon budgets. This picture, uh, a bit harder than the other uh, two slides to tell what's going on there, uh, but what you can see is that 
Uh, in the residential sector, we see a lot of scope for energy efficiency improvement over the next decade. Similarly, in the non-residential sector, so that brings energy demand down. And then we see beyond that initial phase of energy efficiency improvement that people start to switch from uh, conventional gas boilers in the UK to uh, the use of electric heat pumps. And the combination of those things is that we can get our emissions in buildings, again, right down over the next two decades. So that's a, a sectoral uh, story about how you can meet that 2030 notional target which we've recommended to the government. And what I should say is you know, the first reaction of people when we recommended this to government, the first reaction was 60% in 2030 on the path to 80% in 2050 sounds very uh, front-loaded. But actually, if you look at the numbers, it's back-loaded. Uh, that 60% emissions reduction, given where we are now, so we've cut emissions since 1990, it, it requires a 3 uh, percent or slightly higher emissions reduction over the next two decades and then moving to something close to a 5% annual average emissions reduction uh, after that. So for us, well, this is back-ended. That level, that degree of back-ending is okay given the technologies that we think we'll have available uh, post-2030. But any further back-ending certainly puts you on a very high cost path uh, to meeting the 2050 target and starts to raise questions about the credibility. Can you actually meet that 2050 target you're leaving uh, too much to do there. Now, uh, the 2030 target was a framing device for what's gone into the legislation. It's gone into the legislation uh, last week. It was approved both in the House of Commons and the House of Lords, and that's the fourth carbon budget. So you can see on the right-hand side there, uh, the number in the legislation is 1,950 megatons. Uh, and what you can see to the left of that are the carbon budgets, the first three carbon budgets in legislation. So at the moment, those orange budgets are uh, legislated. Now, obviously, there is a, a very significant cut to get to that fourth carbon budget from where we are at the moment from the first carbon budget. Now, the key debates in getting this fourth carbon budget agreed, I don't know how much coverage it got over here, but there was a, a, certainly a, a bit of a divide in the cabinet. And so there was... Uh, very strong support for the fourth carbon budget initially from the Department of Energy, from the Department of Environment, uh, and from the Foreign Office, but there was uh, a bit of caution on the side of the Department for Business, uh, the uh, Treasury, and the Department for Transport. And the debates were all about, well, what is the impact on the macroeconomic situation? That comes down to how much does it cost and what are the spending implications as well uh, for now when the UK government is committed to uh, bringing down its spending. And so in terms of how much does it cost to be on this uh, uh, medium-term emissions path, so getting a 60% cut uh, in 2030 relative to 1990, uh, well, our estimate is it costs about 1% of GDP. And just to understand what that means, uh, it means that you sacrifice a fraction of one year's growth uh, over the next two decades in order to meet that carbon budget. And for us, that is a price worth paying uh, in order to avoid the costs and consequences of climate change. Also, that 1% of GDP, if we're not on the front foot, if we're not making the right investment choices, if we bury our heads in the sand and then we're in a carbon-constrained world, well, the costs will be a lot more than 1% of GDP because we'll be having to scrap uh, technologies, high-carbon technologies that we've invested in, and those turn out to be the wrong choices. So that is the, the least cost path to the 2050 target. Energy price increases are a very important uh, uh, issue politically at the moment, both for the residential sector and also the energy intensives in the context of competitiveness for the iron and steel industry, for example. But being on this path uh, through the 2020s, uh, we've shown we'll have limited energy uh, price impacts and could actually give us relatively low energy prices compared to our uh, competitors elsewhere in the EU. So again, if we're on the front foot, we could have relatively low electricity prices compared to other EU countries. Now, near-term cost implications of being on this path, well, in the case of the UK, there were significant commitments to support low-carbon technology innovation in the context of the spending review, and committing to this, uh, this medium-term fourth carbon budget didn't have any additional uh, spending implications. And in terms of policies, well, again, uh, there are various high-level policy approaches being developed in the UK at the moment, and the fourth carbon budget really will underpin those and will help to take those uh, forward and make those policies into strong, uh, robust policies that can deliver emissions reduction. I think another question which was raised very commonly, particularly by the power 
uh, industry and by the energy intensive sectors is, well, what is the relationship between our climate change legislation and the European framework? And so in particular, uh, a lot of the economy is covered by an EU ETS cap. How do we accommodate that in our framework? Well, the EU ETS is not defined at the moment for the 2020s, but when it is, we will have to align our framework with that European framework. So it is important that we are in sync with what's happening in the EU ETS at the European level. <clears throat> okay, if I just move on to well, what's actually happening, and I've said it's okay to set, or it's good to set very uh, challenging targets, but it's also very important to be on the downward path. And I think in the past what we've been guilty of in the UK is talking a good game. So we've set very ambitious targets, but at the same time emissions uh, have not gone down. And you can see that uh, this picture shows before the recession there was a, a gentle reduction in emissions. Uh, but it was only a gentle reduction. What's happened since uh, the recession is that we got a, a very significant cut in emissions in 2009. Uh, that was about 10% cut uh, at the economy level. And it's not surprising that was due to the recession because energy consumption is a function of economic activity and emissions are a function of uh, uh, energy consumption. So the 10% reduction was pretty much all in 2009 uh, due to the recession, and we highlighted that fact. And uh, the government actually, when they first saw the figures in 2009, they were going around very jubilant, saying, yeah, we've got emissions down uh, by 10%. But I don't think there was, there was any grounds for jubilation there and made that very clear. What's happened in 2010 is that emissions went up by about 3%, but that was purely because of the, uh, the cold winter in 2010. So there was a lot more uh, uh, winter heating days in 2010 and 2009. If you look at the underlying trends, so we've stripped out that impact of the, uh, the cold winter in 2010, the underlying trend is one of broadly flat emissions in the UK at the moment. And what you can see there is the red line says, well, if we continued from where we uh, were in 2010 with the trend in 2010, which is broadly flat, slightly falling, if you compare that to the green line, which is the legislated carbon budgets and then the path to 2050, well, obviously, uh, there's a big gap between those two lines. We need a step change in the pace of emissions reductions in order to meet our legislated carbon budgets and the longer term target. And then, well, uh, <clears throat> what is going to drive that step change? It's got to be new policies. They're not going to happen on their own. People are not suddenly going to become energy efficient. We're not suddenly going to see a rush to invest in low carbon generation without a change in the policy. Uh, framework. And so here's a, a set of things which my organisation has identified, has recommended, has advised the government on uh, as policies that will drive emissions reduction. So electricity market reform. We've highlighted the need to change our electricity market, to move away from a fully liberalised market uh, and to, to give a bit more direction there and introduce long-term contracts. And I expect the government this week in the UK will announce uh, new arrangements in line with those recommendations. It needs technology uh, uh, support. So, for example, key type technologies like CCS, uh, carbon capture and storage on coal-fired power generation, on gas-fired power generation in industry as well. Uh, the government needs to provide money to support that and indeed has committed to do that. The Green Deal, which is about getting people uh, to take advantage of energy efficiency opportunities, being very proactive as a government in helping people to uh, do what, at the end of the day, will get their energy bills down. Uh, is a key thing. There's a, a set of uh, uh, things, uh, energy efficiency certification, climate change agreements, which affect uh, our offices and our industries. And again, we've recommended changes there. Very important to support renewable heat technologies, which are new in the UK, which are relatively expensive uh, for an interim period and which will need subsidies. And again, where the government has committed subsidies. And then to finish, and I know it's an important issue here, uh, agriculture, uh, there is an opportunity to get emissions down, not to reduce it to zero, but there is an opportunity uh, to reduce emissions, and that probably will need uh, new incentives, certainly in the UK, relative to where we are. So let me summarise what I've said uh, about the work of the Climate Change Committee, some of the key things we've recommended. Uh, first of all, uh, we recommended the 80% uh, emissions reduction target, which still remains valid given our current assessment of the science, notwithstanding what you might read uh, in the Daily Mail. The uh, 
implication of that 2050 target for us is that we should be aiming to reduce emissions in 2030 by about 60% on 1990 levels, that's about a 45% emissions reduction relative to today, given what we have already achieved since 1990. Uh, the carbon budget that is consistent with that 2030 target, that 1,950 megatons, which was highly controversial, but is now uh, on the statute book in the UK since last week. Uh, so that is framing everything we do over the next uh, decade to prepare for that longer term emissions reduction path. The costs associated it with the costs associated with it are 1% of GDP, and uh, anything less ambitious there just commits us to higher costs in the future. So if we want to minimise the cost, if we want to maximise economic growth, uh, then we should be on this path consistent with the, uh, the legislative carbon budget. And in terms of policies, well, we need to do something to get on the downward path for emissions, to uh, make it credible that we can achieve these uh, very ambitious carbon budgets we've committed to, and that will need new uh, policies and I think that will be the test of this whole framework. Uh, can we get those policies in place? Can we go from a situation where emissions at the moment in an underlying sense are flat, can we get on the downward path uh, and can we do that pretty soon? And certainly my uh, organisation, our focus now will be holding the feet uh, to the fire for the government and making sure that we get the policies in place, that we get emissions down and then that we can prosper in a carbon constrained world. Thank you.